everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to today's virtual briefing, which will discuss the important intersection between housing insecurity and domestic violence. To begin, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Lucia Corral Peña, Senior Program Officer at Blue Shield of California Foundation. The foundation has long supported efforts to end the cycle of domestic violence, and we're so pleased to continue this work through vital conversations like the one we'll have here today. During our time together, we'll hear about the Domestic Violence Housing First Program, which is an innovative homelessness prevention model that holds significant promise for survivors and families across the state. Before we get started, I wanna go through a few housekeeping items. To avoid background noise, all callers will be automatically muted throughout the webinar. If you would like to ask a question during the course of the presentations, please do so in the question window on your screen. We will do our best to address questions twice during our time together today, once following the, the presentation of our lead researcher and again at the very end of the webinar. Also, just a reminder that today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Foundation's website. Joining me today, joining on today's call, are several California leaders and advocates who, like all of you, are committed to understanding the intrinsic link between domestic violence and homelessness. We know that this issue is more pressing than ever given the current environment and surge in domestic violence cases under quarantine. To help us begin this discussion, I'd like to welcome California's own Senator Susan Rubio. Senator Rubio represents Senate District 22 in the San Gabriel Valley, and we're so pleased to have her join us to set the context for today's conversation. Senator Rubio chairs the Senate Insurance Committee and is a member of several committees, including Health and the Select Committee on the Governor's 2019 Report, Wildfires and Climate Change, California's Energy Future. She is also a domestic violence survivor. One of her top legislative priorities is providing greater resources and expanding domestic violence protections for, for victims. She has helped to pass legislation and extend, that extends the time period during which survivors can press charges against those who cause them harm. And she continues to fight for more funding to support housing and violence prevention programs. Senator Rubio, we're so grateful to have you here with us today. Uh, I, I ask all of us to, uh, to join me in, warm, in a warm welcome of Senator Rubio. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and uh, at home, of course, with families and um, taking care of your loved ones. I wanted to first start off by thanking the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence and the Blue Shield of California Foundation for having me here today. And of course, all of you listening and joining us today, uh, this is a very important uh, and personal issue. As you've already heard, it's something that I take very seriously and continue to, to fight um, wholeheartedly to ensure that we have more support and funding for victims. Uh, now more than ever during the stay-at-home order, we need to be cognizant of domestic violence survivors and ensure that we continue to provide uh, state funding specifically to allow access to services. Uh, the current uncertain situation around COVID-19 brings a much higher anxiety level to, to some folks at home. Uh, as we know, home isn't always a safe place for everyone, especially um, as it pertains to domestic violence. And during these times, it's very difficult to provide uh, support for victims and their partners to seek support as well. Um, there is an article in the New York Times recently um, that referred to the uptick in domestic violence incidents as another public health crisis, specifically that domestic violence is acting like an opportunistic infection flourishing in the conditions created by the pandemic. And so both the psychological and physical mistreatment partners can inflict on each other when they're together in a confined space mm -hmm. is likely to increase the risk of abuse during this time. Uh, we know that there's a lot of uh, social pressures. Uh, so, for example, not being able to pay rent, uh, unemployment, all this adds to the anxiety, the stress, and potential harm in the home. Um, in fact, uh, many abusers use power and control as a method uh, to abuse uh, otherwise known as coercive control, and many times coercive control includes controlling uh, either the financial resources of the individual or restricting access and communication to family, friends, or even um, go as far as depriving survivors of basic necessities. 
something that I shared I have personal experience with. Um, that is why this year I'm proud to author SB uh, 1141, which will define role in the Family Code and provide further education on this important policy discussion. I'm also working closely with uh, my bill sponsor, which is the LA City Attorney Mike Fewer, along with my colleagues in the legislature, and of course uh, the partnership and many more advocates. <laughs> It's critical legislation. Um, also, I'm working closely with the partnership, my Senate colleagues and uh, assembly members um, on a budget request along with the governor's office and pushing forward uh, the budget request for $30 million to address housing and homelessness needs for domestic violence survivors. Uh, the $30 million will be allocated to California Office of Emergency Services and it will go to three specific areas. Um, there are already existing programs. Uh, one is the Domestic Violence Assistance Program. Uh, the other is Transitional Housing, which is currently only federally funded. And uh, lastly, uh, the focus on our conversation today, which is the Domestic Violence Housing First Program, which is also solely funded through the Federal Victims of Crime Act Fund. Uh, this funding is critical in providing survivors with essential supportive services. Uh, publishing a list of hotlines to call for help is great. However, we have to do much more to protect people who are experiencing this. Um, again, the need is absolutely necessary, especially during these times. The intersection between domestic violence and COVID-19 is so apparent. Programs across the state are now seeing an increase in demands and services. Um, and it's uh, really sad when I hear stories of individuals who are trying to either get housing or support and they're having a difficult time present in the situation of COVID-19. So, for example, the Korean American Family Services in Los Angeles has seen their call volume for, I believe, more than double for their bilingual DV uh, crisis hotline. So that's just an indication uh, as to what's happening. A woman died in Montecito County in late March after being attacked by her husband, who had numerous arrests for domestic violence. So all this um, I really take um, into consideration as I push for policies, and hopefully I can help with the housing funding. In addition, it is important to recognize that 38% of all domestic violence victims become homeless at some point in their lives. And during this webinar today, you will learn more about the Domestic Violence Housing First Model, an innovative approach providing housing and financial stability for domestic violence survivors and their families, reaching over 900 survivors, and it's pretty significant. I'm happy to hear that early evidence suggests that this intervention may prevent homelessness, abuse, and interrupt negative trajectory for survivors and their children. Um, yeah, I, I was a former teacher as well uh, for 17 years, and even as a, an educator, um, uh, children would come to me and share that they would sleep at homes uh, because mommy had to flee or, you know, very um, heartbreaking stories. And, and so I've heard um, the impact that homelessness has on these families. I've seen it firsthand, and not to mention for children uh, and their education as well. Uh, so I'm so grateful for the work that my colleagues in the legislature, the governor, and all the advocacy groups are doing on behalf of survivors of abuse, and especially so thankful for this evalu uh, the evaluation report conducted by Blue Shield of California Foundation that supports the need for critical domestic violence housing services. Uh, we must continue to work towards eliminating abuse while also providing continued assistance for survivors to move forward with their life. So thank you once again for having me here, and I do look forward to, to the recommendations set forth to increase the reach and effectiveness of this model. I thank the panelists for the input you're about to give and organize all of, all of you listening out there. Um, and if there's any domestic violence victims, I always want to convey that um, we're here, we're listening, we believe you, and we're ready to help whenever we can. So thank you so much, and stay safe. Thank you so much, Senator Rubio. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we are just so uh, grateful to have leaders like you championing this important and complex work and always bringing your authentic voice uh, to the table for solutions. Um, so as you, as, as you've just set us up so perfectly for the rest of the conversation, um, as I mentioned at the start of our call, I'm Lucia Corral Peña. I lead Blue Shield of California Foundation's efforts to break the cycle of domestic violence. 
For almost two decades, the foundation has partnered with organizations and leaders across the state to prevent and address uh, domestic violence, and we are proud to have contributed more than 100 million to this work. Uh, through our efforts, we've seen success stories and also prevailing challenges. And one that has remained clear is the issue of housing insecurity. For so many survivors, they are faced with two choices, mm -hmm. either stay in an abusive relationship or risk homelessness. Particularly when children are involved, choosing to, choosing to stay can feel like the only option for survivors. Unfortunately, this can perpetuate the ongoing cycle of violence into new generations. The current COVID-19 crisis, as Senator Rubio mentioned, has not made this issue any easier. People and families are being pushed into pressurized states of stress that fuel family violence, and isolation has resulted in a swell of new domestic violence cases across the globe, across the country, and across California. Many people in our state are remaining in violent housing situations due to the crisis, while others simply don't have access to, to the type of care and the support that they need. Despite this immediate need, we cannot solve the challenge in front of us without also looking at its root causes and working to create systemic and structural changes that can prevent violence before it affects so many lives. Unfortunately, this is not a new problem, but it does require broader and more innovative solutions. New economic security policies, programs, and practices that offer long-term opportunities and impact for survivors and their families can begin to change their trajectory. To provide a stronger evidence base for the vital role of housing security in addressing and preventing domestic violence, the foundation funded an in-depth review of the Domestic Violence Housing First Model here in California. Mm -hmm. This program was first funded and implemented by the California Office of Emergency Services in 2016 with the aim of helping survivors find safe, permanent housing and receive flexible, tailored, supportive services. With technical assistance from the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, we commissioned a review of this important model to better understand how it's working for survivors and if so, why. The evaluation led by Michigan State University Research Consortium on gender-based violence showed us that the Housing First model can, in fact, engender positive change for survivors, prevent homelessness, and bring possibility back into the lives of whole families. By better understanding and supporting this model, we can meet our collective goal of ending homelessness and domestic violence in the state. With that in mind, I'd like to turn it over to our next speaker, Dr. Gabriela lopez Ceron. Associate Director of the Michigan State University Research Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. Dr. Lopez Ceron and Dr. Chris Sullivan are national domestic violence evaluation experts and were the lead researchers on the report titled Examining the Impact of the Domestic Violence Housing First Model in California, a Multi-Pronged Evaluation. Dr. Lopez Ceron is going to walk us through results and data from the report to help us better understand the model is three pillars and how we know it's working in the state. After her presentation, we'll open the floor to questions. So please submit any questions during her comments using the question box on your screen. We're lucky to have her with us from the East Coast. She is going to need to depart a little earlier after she concludes her presentation. And then we'll proceed to our next panel discussion. So Dr. Lopez Ceron, please take it away. Thank you so much, Lucia, for our wonderful introduction. I'm um, thrilled to be here with you today to talk to you um, about the results of this evaluation that we conducted. Um, but first, I'd like to start by acknowledging um, this work couldn't have happened without the support of the Blue Shield of California Foundation and the support of um, the California Governor's Office for Emergency Services and the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence. I also would like to acknowledge all participant agencies, staff, advocate, leadership, and community partners who were so willing to talk with us and talk with our research team about their experience implementing this model. And I would also like to acknowledge all survivors who shared their stories with us and contributed their time and expertise um, to this evaluation and our wonderful research team here at Michigan State University Research Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. Slide. 
So I'd like to start out by giving a very brief overview of the domestic violence housing force and what its core components are. So this is a model that has been adapted um, from the housing force homelessness model um, to address the specific needs of uh, survivors of gender-based violence. So the three components um, are survivor-driven trauma-informed mobile advocacy, flexible financial assistance, and community engagement. Slide. So the uh, first pillar um, really uh, speaks to the importance of advocates focusing on addressing the needs that are identified by survivors specifically, rather than on predetermined needs promoted by agencies. Um, could you go back to the previous slide, please? Um, then in, in this particular, thank you, in this particular uh, pillar, uh, the advocates are mobile. So that means that they are meeting survivors where it is safe and convenient for them. And they're engaging in trauma-informed process as um, they provide advocacy services. Slide. The second pillar um, speaks to providing flexible financial assistance. And this is assistance that can be directly related to housing. Um, so uh, thinking of security deposits, temporary rental assistance, utility bills, and so forth. But also funds that may not be viewed by others as impacting housing directly, but that advocates truly recognize that there are critical in housing stability help, such as repairing cars so they don't lose their jobs or help expunging a prior conviction that is preventing them from obtaining um, government-funded housing or help repairing a bad credit. So the, the aim of this uh, assistance is for it to be flexible, to, for it to actually meet the unique and specific needs of each family. Slide. And then the final component of the domestic violence housing first model includes proactive engagement between advocates and people in the community who would help support the safety, stability, and well-being of survivors. This includes engaging with health professionals, law enforcement, and the legal system, educators and school administrators, religious and spiritual leaders, and others. Um, with the specific regards of obtaining housing, advocates then forge mutually beneficial relationships with landlords, city officials, and housing councils to obtain vouchers or rental agreements on behalf of survivors. Slide. So, let me tell you a little bit about um, the evaluation that we conducted in California. So um, initially, the Cal OES office funded eight organizations. Um, and then the following year, they funded another 25 more for a total of 33 organizations. And then after that year, they funded another 30 organizations or so. So this evaluation was conducted in this like when the second wave of organizations were funded. And so all three organizations were invited to participate. <coughs> Excuse me. All three organizations were invited to participate. A total 19 of those organizations opted into the statewide evaluation portion. We also conducted a longitudinal evaluation with 36 domestic violence housing first participants and interviewed key community partners in a, um, a Los Angeles-based organization, Rainbow Services, who had been implementing the model for uh, a couple of years. And then finally, we also conducted an in-depth review on how another domestic violence organization implements all three pillars of the model. Um, and this organization is located in Napa Valley News. So I'm very excited to highlight some of the findings of this evaluation. The, um, the first part of it speaks to the statewide evaluation in which 19 agencies track the distribution of funds to clients through a spreadsheet that we provided. And provided the technical assistance for it. 
The spreadsheet tracks how much money each client received, what the funds were used for, and what the immediate outcome was after receiving the funds. Slide. Um, and when permanent housing was achieved. So 19 agencies tracked a little over $3 million in flexible funds that were distributed to 925 survivors and their families over the course of 21 months. During this time, as you can see, disbursements range from anywhere from 50 cents for something that they um, needed to pay a fee to $6,000 or so. A total of 4,010 payments were tracked and were made to support survivors' unique needs. And so on average, survivors received four payments, so about $3,000 in, in total. And it should be noted here that not all of these 19 agencies started tracking their spending at the same time. And so the average payment per survivor may have differed if we look at agency-specific data, because agencies were beginning the implementation of the model at different times as they were getting funded and set up to doing that. So for some, that average amount is somewhere between three to six thousand dollars that um, survivors might have received. Slide. So as a direct result of receiving flexible financial assistance, 58%, so that's about 540 survivors, used the funds to prevent homelessness. The vast majority of these payments were used to help survivors stay in their own home or move from one home to another so that survivors never became homeless at any time. Of those 540 survivors who avoided homelessness, um, these funding helped 425 survivors, or 46% of them, to stay in their own home. These survivors and their children were then able to remain safely housed and avoid homelessness or um, any other unwanted moves with the use of this funding. And this is just remarkable data because given um, the housing crisis in California but in the rest of the country, um, including the just the severe shortage of affordable housing and increasing housing costs, financial assistance that gives survivors the option to stay in their current home, if that is their preference, while also minimizing the risk of becoming homeless, is absolutely critical. And so I have this um, quote to share with you from one of our participants who says, I was on the verge of becoming homeless. And thanks to the Domestic Violence Housing First program, I'm able to keep a roof over my children's head. Slide. Slide, please. Hmm. Great, thanks. So, as a direct result of receiving, oh, could you go mm -hmm. back to the previous one? As a direct result of receiving this flexible financial assistance, um, there was 40 percent uh, who were able to obtain new housing so um, that was their preference to move from their previous house to obtain new housing like just participants <laughs> shared with us they helped me with my deposit furniture and beds living room sets diner set and dresser they helped me with diapers and clothing for my one-year-old we have not had any of these items in years this particular quote is uh, impactful because you can see just the, the multiple needs that a survivor might have, especially if they have been experiencing homelessness with a small child and how impactful the flexible financial assistance can be for um, her and her children. Next slide, please. So additionally, between um, the evaluation period, between the time of the evaluation period, so that is roughly between July of 2018 and March of 2019, we distributed client feedback surveys. So 273 were completed by the 19 participating agencies um, in which we were able to collect data um, 
regarding the experiences from survivors directly themselves and how they perceive their experience in the program and the impact that it had. Um, and so these were anonymous surveys that were sent directly to our team. From this survey, so from 273 participants, um, they reported that 95% of them felt that their advocate was very focused on their strengths. 92% of them uh, felt that they were flexible about where they met. So thinking back to that pillar around mobile advocacy and being able to meet with their advocate wherever it was safe and convenient for them. 90% of them reported that their advocate helped reach their housing goals. Um, so that's um, amazing. We were able to collect data in three different languages. 59% of the surveys that were um, sent back to us were completed in English, 29% were in Spanish, and 12% were in Korean. Next slide, please. And so the flexibility component in receiving and distributing these uh, funding continues to be instrumental um, in meeting the oh, diversity okay. of survivor needs. Pardon? Mm -hmm. The flexibility, the flexibility in receiving and distributing this flexible funding continues to be instrumental in meeting the diversity of survivor needs, as illustrated by some of these experiences. So I'd like to share um, with you. Um, this has been changed uh, to not have this person's real name. Mariela was homeless when she started working with the nonprofit agency in LA. The agency supported her with DV housing first flexible financial assistance to pay for move-in costs and first month's rent of her new housing. The following month, she needed financial support for furniture assistance and rental assistance in order to stay in her new home. Then due to changing circumstances and needs, three months later, she received help with move-in costs for a new home. Due to the flexibility and immediate disbursement of funds, Mariela and her family were able to avoid moving back into homelessness and were able to move into another home. So in total, this participant received about $5,000 in five separate payments to support her in her journey towards housing stability. Slide. So this other case, Anna, um, also not her real name, she was housed and she wished to stay in her own home. And so following that, she was able to work with an agency in the greater San Francisco area to receive advocacy and financial support to help her stay in her home. Her first four payments were across four months and helped with utility, utility and rental debt, as well as basic needs for food and gas. The debt assistance helped her catch up with rent. Then the following month, she received funds to help with her current month's rent. And due to the um, changing circumstances, she received help with rent two months later, and then in another two months, she received help with utilities. So during this time period, she received about $3,000 over eight separate payments to cover these costs. And because of the support, she was able to avoid any unwanted moves and actually stay in her home. Slide. So in those two particular cases, I think um, they do uh, a nice job in highlighting kind of the trajectory of uh, participants in receiving this flexible financial assistance um, and being able to meet them um, where they are and meet their needs. So I also want to uh, share some perceptions directly from participants, like this um, specific quote. This participant says, I'm paid until July, and I'm stable and safe. And there's no reason for me not to stay in current housing. I mean that I can close my door and my kids can have a safe bed to sleep, a warm bed to sleep. They have food if they're hungry. They have entertainment. They don't need for anything. They're good. This really highlighting, this participant very much highlighting the impact that this um, has not only on her, but on her children and their safety and their well-being and stability. Slide. 
Um, I'd like to also share this next quote. This participant says, thanks to this program, I have a place to live for me and my two kids. Thanks to this program, I have settled other costs that were not in my plan. Thanks to this program, I have been able to survive everything. They have also taught me to carry and manage my money better. So this participant is really highlighting the importance of housing for her and her two kids and just the multiple things that she has needed to juggle as she's reaching housing and financial stability. So I'd like to end with um, some of the lessons learned and implications of this evaluation. Um, the first and foremost is that this flexible financial assistance can be critical to help effectively, um, to, to effectively help survivors and their families prevent homelessness and maintain their housing stability. And um, we know how important that is. Um, additionally, the advocate's ability to pair flexible financial assistance with trauma-informed advocacy that is also survivor-driven and mobile is really key to help survivors not only obtain, but also maintain their housing stability. Um, third, the leadership and staff of organizations have really implemented proactive and responsive strategies to establish and maintain relationships with community partners. So there are organizations that have really strong connections with um, stores that sell furniture or with um, mechanics to help participants with their um, car pro bono and just to help the well-being and stability of survivors in the community. And finally, it is uh, something that came to light in our exploration, both with Rainbow and News, is that it is really important that organizations have an organizational structure that allows for flexible work schedules and that promotes ongoing training and support staff to successfully implement the model, especially as uh, one of the components is being able to meet survivors where they're at and have flexibility into where and when they meet. Um, but with that, I'd like to um, close today and open it up for any questions um, on this evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriela. We are now going to take any questions specific to her presentation and the, about the evaluation. Please note that we'll continue to keep microphones muted, but welcome your questions via the chat box at any time. Okay, I don't see that we have any questions so far. So uh, if you have questions um, moving forward again, just please paste them in the chat box. Thank you so much for uh, this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gabriela, for uh, presenting this compelling evidence. And we appreciate the fantastic work that you and your team have done to pull this evaluation together for California. Thank you very much. It's uh, been my pleasure to work with amazing organizations across the state and with Blue Shield and the partnership. So I am honored to be here and appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all about this um, wonderful work that um, advocates and agencies across the state are doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. Um, so to, so uh, to help us further understand the deep relationship between these two challenges, domestic violence and homelessness prevention, I'd like to welcome a panel of experts that we're excited that we are excited are joining us here today. Uh, we have Elizabeth Eastland, who's the executive Dir director of Rainbow Services in Long Beach. We have Barbara Capos, executive director of the East Los Angeles Women's Center. Nilda Val Morris, executive director of My Sister's House in Sacramento, and Jessica Barcelo, policy advocate with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Welcome to all four of you. Um, and also, just a quick reminder, if you have questions during this panel, please type them into the question window at any time, and we'll do our best to answer questions 
uh, answer them during the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. With that, I'll begin our discussion. And rather than opening or uh, rather than asking our presenters to do introductory remarks, what I'm going to do is ask them uh, questions so that we can dive right into the content of the evaluation. So let's start by hearing from a couple of you uh, that participated in the Domestic Violence Housing First program here in California. We heard the evaluation takeaways from Dr. Uh, Lopez Teron. But what are the big impacts and learnings from your perspective? And I'm going to ask um, Elizabeth and Barbara to lead us off. Elizabeth? Okay. Sure. Sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth with Rainbow Services. We're actually in San Pedro, but I'd love to expand to Long Beach. It's lovely there. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, the questions about the key takeaways on the evaluation, I think one of the things that initially struck me was the percentage of homelessness that was pre prevented for survivors, 58% prevented homelessness through this program. But even bigger than that, the fact that 46% of survivors were able to stay in their own homes, I think is a real game changer for our domestic violence field that has put a lot of emphasis on people needing to leave their homes. And absolutely, some survivors will need to leave their homes for safety reasons. Though if we can look and do um, quality assessments to see if it's safe for people to stay in their homes, that's gonna cost the state a lot less money than for people to actually leave their homes and establish a household elsewhere. So those were, were some of my big ones. And then there was a specific evaluation done or Rainbow Services on our program, and there was a lot of gems in there, and I know the evaluation will be shared. But I think one of the biggest pieces from the program evaluation was the need of survivors to be connected to other survivors and the, the ongoing need to have social support. So that's really important that this is not just paying someone's rent, but that mobile advocacy and the connection to services is really important for survivors. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, this is Barbara Capos from the East Los Angeles Women's Center, and we've had this project going on three years that served over 200 families. Our, problem, our program is called Housing Solutions for it. It goes beyond putting a Band-Aid on a problem. It empowers survivors to work with the team to solve their housing issues long-term. Each survivor, each family is unique and their needs through this program is addressed individually through this project. Every effort and cost is directed <clears throat> at preventing homelessness. It may be that they need financial support to pay for their rent because they are fin financially cut off by their abuser, or they may need to flee and be rehoused to prevent homelessness. There are several steps in rehousing, but the team of housing specialists work with the survivor throughout the process. Additionally, additionally, we work with our community conducting housing workshops, creating alliances with landlords and their collectives, partnering with businesses and other public and private institutions to help make these transitions effective. Our lesson is that through this trauma and culturally responsive approach, survivors gained their dignity, restore their resiliency, and give them an opportunity to attain a more improved quality of life for themselves and their children. Thank you, Barbara. I'm going to have a quick follow-up question for Elizabeth. Elizabeth, can you say a little bit more about, um, you mentioned the 46% staying in their home. Can you, and yes. and I, I, it being a game changer, meaning um, the, the vision about of victims or survivors needing to leave their home for safety. But can you say a little bit more about how staying in their home maintains safety since it's such a different model? Sure. I mean, I think that there has always been this sense that in order for people to stay safe, they have to leave their household. And honestly, just on a personal level, I, I feel like we've gotten it wrong, making survivors leave their home and their community is not always the best choice for them. Why aren't we making the person who's harming them leave? So there's just the model has been set up how it has been set up, and I get that. So I think if we ask more questions of the survivor, if we ask more questions 
about their situation with the person who's harming them, then we can reveal more um, insight into whether or not it's safe for them to stay at home. Not all abusive relationships reach the point where someone needs to go and be hidden. And again, there are some that absolutely do. But when you think about if you had to leave your home right now and walk away from your community and your friends and everyone that supports you, that is really hard to do. So I think it is better for survivors if they are able to maintain those community connections where they're living, if it's safe to do so. And I just want to emphasize that because I know that this can be controversial for some. It has to be safe for them to do so. And I think as a field, we can do a better job with assessing someone's safety and trying to figure out, is it safe for them to stay in their own home? And if it is, then, you know, the kids stay in their own school district. The person may continue being employed in their community and they keep those community connections. So I think that that's why it's so important. And it's just a game changer because it's a little bit different than how we've always thought about things. Mm -hmm. Great. Does Thank you. We'll it? we'll come back to that. It does. Thank you. And we're we'll, we're getting a number of questions, so we'll come back to some some of these this piece at the end of the at the end of the webinar. I am going to ask. Um, uh, I'm going to move to asking maybe Nilda. You know what what are the unique needs of domestic violence survivors that make the domestic violence housing first findings especially important and effective for families? There are two that I want to cite, Lucia. Um, I think the first unique need is that survivors need to feel empowered. Uh, they've been under the control of someone, so when we give them the control, give them back their control, that that's really helpful. That's really powerful, uh, and especially when it comes regards to uh, where they're uh, laying their heads at night. Um, and that DVH finding here um, has shown that you know that empowerment feeling has helped prevent homelessness of. Um, you want almost a thousand survivors, I think, is what the report shared. Um, secondly, I think, uh, and this one's sort of more implied, uh, but it especially applies to survivors with language and cultural barriers who um, uh, are a target audience of my sister's house, and uh, and especially in California where we have so many um, uh, survivors with language and uh, facing language and cultural issues. They need extra time. That's their need. They need time uh, to be able to rebuild their lives, to begin to heal from their trauma. Um, when a survivor is an immigrant, they may not have their immigration status to legally gain employment. Uh, they obviously may still not uh, be able to speak fluent English. They may need the education or at least their GED to gain employment. And with this Housing First program, uh, we've been able to assist clients with that employer authorization, helping them get their G GED and to learn English. Uh, and that's been critical. We, If it wasn't um, for this Housing First, uh, we could not have had the effect on helping change many of our survivors' lives. So it's been a real game changer in that regard. And that's, uh, I think, two of the unique needs that survivors mm -hmm. have. Great, thank you. I'm going to uh, touch back a little bit on the theme that Senator Rubio raised about the the shelter at home and the current pandemic. Um, this is a question I think for Jessica and Barbara to answer. You know, the pandemic is shining a light on the health threats related to homelessness and the increases in violence uh, in stressful and unstable times. I'm wondering if you can share some examples of how your groups are working differently right now to address these challenges. There's a lot of media attention on this issue, and I think that piece is maybe is a little more hidden. Sure. Uh, this is Jess Barcelo with the Western Center on Lump. First, um, try at responding to that question. We um, we here at the Western Center on Law and Poverty, we work at the state capitol on state legislation, but we also serve as a support center for legal services throughout the state, uh, with, throughout the state of California. Um, we just last week were on a call with our, our legal services clinics, which provide free legal assistance to low income people throughout the state that they, um, first and foremost, they're moving, they, they like everybody else have to move their services outside of 
um, you know, their, their place of employment. And so they have call-in, um, call-in clinics uh, for domestic abuse survivors rather than, um, than in-person clinics, which is what they've had before. Um, in the beginning, they, you know, they, they might have walk-in times that people could walk in. So instead, they set up set hours. And they first started out, one, one legal services reported that they first started out with four hours um, a day of receiving calls for the clinic, and that wasn't enough. So they doubled it. They're definitely seeing an increased need for uh, legal services uh, related to domestic abuse and domestic violence. So that's one thing I just want to report is that, um, you know, that we are, we're seeing what everybody else is seeing, which is an increase in incidents and need for services and trying to do that in a context of um, being out of, out of the office and having to do these conversations over the phone um, and by internet. Uh, on that point, as people may know, the, the Public Human Services Network throughout the state of California also has had to move to mostly online and um, by internet communications. And, um, and what we, what we know about providing social services, whether it's, you know, CalFresh, uh, CalWorks, and the various forms of housing assistance through that program, um, or Medi-Cal, is that some of, um, some of the special services or supports or waivers of, um, required documentation, et cetera, um, rely, you know, can be given to people who have a, and, and are experiencing domestic abuse. The problem is, is that it's it's really hard over the phone to to have that disclosure happen, um, and it's certainly um, not an option in most cases to have verification of those situations. Some counties still require verification of domestic abuse status, uh, which is something we've been working on for a long time uh, to get um, to get changed at the state level, um, and uh, so we have been asking the state government to please. Uh, provide more leniency when it comes to special accommodations for people with domestic abuse um, in, in the administration of all of these programs, these public human services programs, um, and also asking for them to, to give us a report back with regards to um, how uh, any increases in utilization of some of these provisions. For example, the CalWORKs program has um, a shelter or a, a hotel or motel voucher program that's specifically for applicants of the CalWORKs program so that they can receive very urgently the um, motel voucher with self-verification of a um, domestic abuse situation and, and with, you know, prior to being determined um, eligible for aid. These are usually given out in, in person and um, in the offices, and so we're monitoring how available these extra services are for applicants in the CalWORKs program who might be fleeing abuse for the first time to um, to receive these hotel and motel vouchers. So those are some of the things we've been trying to track and um, and pursue with regards to program leniency and support services. Um, in closing, I and I'll be here for the other questions, I just wanted to say that I also am a survivor of domestic abuse and I do, um, I just value so much the, the leadership that we have coming from Senator Rubio and the other um, leaders who have experienced abuse and are bringing that experience to the table. So uh, with much gratitude for that, thank you. Thank you, okay. Jessica. Barbara? Yes. Um, well, as I know, many will um, say that this has been more than a challenging time, especially for those um, impacted by domestic violence. In the past month, we've been inundated with hotline calls and, and um, chat line uh, requests, most seeking shelter and housing, and most of the um, organizations here in Los Angeles are full to capacity. Um, I think the other challenge is working with individuals remotely. Um, and, you know, for many of our clients, they have really, um, some of them have done okay with this. Others have really are uncomfortable. Um, and some of the, even the staff are uncomfortable because of possibly um, they're living in crowded areas. They have other people, um, you know, around them. So there's a lack of privacy, confidentiality. So that has also been a challenge and a challenge in, in disclosure. So we um, are a part of uh, Mayor Garcetti's um, 
safe project. Um, it is, we're working with several other organizations throughout LA County, um, providing temporary shelter through hotels. Um, and so in the past um, couple weeks, we have placed 33 families in a hotel. This is temporary. So um, when this project ends, which will be towards the end of June, we will be faced with, you know, placing all of these families um, either back to their homes or, or in other shelters or transitional housing. So, um, but at this point now, this is a an opportunity for people to, um, you know, escape their, um, you know, their home environment if it's violent. And we've had many instances as this. Um, the um, other issues that have arise during this period is children that were placed in foster care, um, not being able to visit with their families because of the um, um, the, the rules and at um, shelter in place. So some of those kids have not been able to visit. And um, others, we were given long-term visitation without a court date in sight. So um, those are other challenges. So, um, you know, we have faced every day new challenges with um, mm -hmm. this crisis period. And um, the other important issue is that we continue to educate um, the families staying in, um, in the shelter, in the transitional housing, in the hotels, about, you know, staying safe, keeping healthy. It can be a challenge, um, especially, you know, when you're um, feeling very stressed and um, not sure of your future. Um, this is a very difficult time um, for all of us, but most importantly, um, the families we work with. So um, um, that's where we're at at this time during this crisis. Thank you both. I think the what I'm what just just jumps out at me in, in those responses are the, the the immediate complexity facing families, the um, mm. both the complexity in terms of needs, but also the com complexity in terms of the systems that touch or don't touch in this moment, um, the whole family, uh, both the, the survivor and children. Um, I'm going to ask one more question before we move on to, um, to Krista. Um, and that is, you know, what action is needed now by policymakers? And I'm curious about, you know, the state, county, and local responses as well. Um, Jessica, you're our, you're our policy expert on the panel. I'm going to direct that question to you. And, and Milda, I know you've been doing some policy work with a culturally responsive network. So I'm curious about that as well. So Jessica, do you want to start us off? Great. Sure. And I and I covered some of that, uh, some of your question, I guess, in my first response, but to let you know that I um I know that the question of um abuse and increases in um likelihood of incidents of abuse uh, during the shutdown um, is definitely front of mind for the county administrators uh, that they are having uh, separate conversations about the topic and what to do in response. Um, and one of the most important uh, pieces that, uh, you know, that they're trying to do is to make sure that at least for those who are those families who are low income and rely on public human services in order to prevent, um, you know, the harm of poverty, um, or at least reduce it. Uh, one of the, the most important efforts uh, today is to make sure that people remain on aid. And so there has been a relief of report uh, requirements for people in the CalWORKs, CalFresh, and Medi-Cal programs. Um, there's also been um, some a, a special accommodations to make sure that people can uh, process any kind of information or change reports by phone. And um, but with you know even with that information and the ability to to communicate with pe with your worker about changes in your household status by phone, we do know that the the phone lines are really busy. And just yesterday we heard um, that the number for the EBT call center, it which is the EBT electronic benefit transfer card, um, this is the card that people receive their benefits on, that that call center is uh, was so busy that it it stopped being able to take calls. Um, for people familiar, familiar with that program, you might know that one of the ways that um, one of the things people have to do if they are low income and leaving a situation is uh, to make sure that they can transfer whatever benefits they may still have um, 
you know, on the card onto a, a second private card. And that's actually a change that we got over the last couple of years that allows somebody who's receiving cash assistance or food assistance on an EBT card to be able to leave the home and, um, and transport their benefits. Um, and in fact, get replacement benefits uh, if they're uh, leaving a home due to abuse. Um, but they can do that on an EBT card. The first step in that process is to call your county and call the EBT card uh, location. And the reason for putting it on a separate card is to make sure that your activities after you leave the home cannot be traced by another person who may have access and information about how to, about your EBT card um, because they were in your household previously. Um, so we are concerned about uh, the ability of somebody who's who relies on these public social services and needs to leave their home um, to be able to do so, uh, bringing with them uh, the benefits that they will need uh, moving forward. Uh, so I'll just I'll put that out there as some of the critical thinking and in, in addressing the unique situation that we're in um, within the county context. Great, thank you, Jessica. Nilda, do you have some thoughts here? Yeah, I, I have three thoughts. Uh, so the first is I think currently the uh, time limit on this program is 24 months. Um, we'd like to see it increase to 36 months, um, if if not longer. Uh, you know, for any survivor, it's difficult getting um, your life rebuilt in 24 months, especially for, uh, again, those with language and cultural issues, that extra, extra time is really important. Um, our culturally responsive domestic violence network was just speaking on the phone the other day about, you know, the connection with, especially with uh, COVID, you know, the connection between housing and jobs uh, and the, the economic part has been a really important issue uh, for uh, our network. And we've been, um, with that in mind, um, not that I have the specifics thought out, but I think that there, it's important to have a soft touch connection with work and with these benefits, right? Um, or uh, maybe a little firmer touch might be the better example, because I know that many of our domestic violence organizations are really encouraging survivors to get jobs, especially in this post-COVID period, it's gonna be even more critical. Um, and so whatever the connection that could be made with, really with uh, uh, survivors in terms of getting jobs, that that's really gonna be crucial. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, just wanting to make sure that um, I know that with uh, KFAM's participation, uh, the, the demographics of the population kind of represented California in terms of being Asian Pacific Islander represented. But I think if you had taken KFAM out, I'm not sure that you would have had the same kind of uh, representation in terms of Asian Pacific Islanders uh, benefiting from this Housing First program. Uh, and so just wanting again to make sure that uh, all our communities are benefiting locally uh, from the Housing First program, especially where those uh, communities are uh, might have uh, bigger numbers. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. You both touched on a lot of different ways that policymakers could be thinking about this issue and supporting survivors uh, that would strengthen the domestic violence housing, the domestic violence housing first program. I'm going to thank you so much. We'll come back to Q and A to the panel in, in just a few minutes. Um, uh, I'm going to round out our pro. Or we are going to round out our program uh, by turning it over to Kristen Enzik. Uh, she's the public policy manager with the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, and we know Krista well. Um, she will respond. She's very knowledgeable uh, about the issues, um, at both the, the how we've done historically and some of the vision for the field going forward in terms of what's possible in prevention. And I'm going to ask Krista to respond to what she's heard today, both from the evaluation findings that were shared as well as our panel comments. Um, and uh, after that, after Krista speaks, we'll move uh, to Q&A for the rest of the webinar. Krista? Great, thank you so much, Lucia. Um, it's such a pleasure to get to join this group of incredible advocates and experts. Um, you know, as I listen to the evaluation results and to the panel, I think what is striking to me is the immense challenges that survivors face in navigating through housing needs, 
safety, poverty, um, a pandemic at the moment, um, but also the tremendous amount of solutions that exist. Um, as we look at the data of how many survivors were able to prevent their homelessness, were able to never have to go through that experience of becoming homeless and having to then restore housing and rebuild stability, but we're able to see that continue. Um, the number of survivors who are able to do so and stay in their own home and you know avoid the disruption that can come from having to relocate. And I think what is underlying that is the reality of survivors recognizing what they need and knowing what they need in their lives. And the tremendous amount of resourcefulness that the advocates at programs like East LA Women's Center and My Sister's House and Rainbow Services bring to their work in working with clients to navigate a maze of needs, right? You've heard um, Jeff Bartholo touch on CalWORKs and CalFresh um, and the critical role that our safety net programs play for survivors. You've heard Nilda talk about um, work and employment, which is core to how everyone is able to pay rent and pay for their housing, um, let alone program requirements and navigating our housing and homelessness systems and healing from the trauma and abuse that survivors have experienced. So, you know, as I sit with all of this, I think from the state level perspective, um, one of the takeaways I have in getting to work with my colleague, Miranda, who has worked so closely with all of the domestic violence housing first grantees and from hearing from all of them, it has been the transformative nature of the work, of being able to say yes to survivors on the needs that they have, being able to have flexibility in how we meet needs um, and not having to be tied to quite as rigid a box as many programs can often come with. And as we navigate through the COVID crisis, um, we know that communities that were already vulnerable and were already struggling, like domestic violence survivors, are going to feel the impact far more um, and are going to have a longer and slower recovery um, from this crisis. And that the needs are going to linger. So the intersection of domestic violence and housing and homelessness was a crisis in January, and it's a crisis today, and it will unfortunately continue to be a crisis um, well into the fall and into the next fiscal year. So we are just really delighted to be able to keep lifting up solutions, lifting up positive programs like the Domestic Violence Housing First model, but I think really chart a path forward to what is possible. We know that there are solutions and we know that with support, we can help make sure that programs have the tools they need and that survivors are able to stay, stay safely and stably housed. And so while there are incredibly challenging budget decisions to be made at the state level and at the federal level, um, this is a time when it's important for us to keep lifting up what can be done and what's needed to be done to protect the most vulnerable. So the model we'll keep talking about at the state level. I know folks on the call continue to sing its praises at the local level. Um, we lift this up to our federal partners as well, because um, we know that in this moment it will take every component of our society's response to COVID working together to help support our community. Thank you so much, Krista, and uh, thank you to all our panelists for your thoughtfulness and insights. We're now going to open things up for questions. We have a number of them in the queue now. As a reminder, uh, if you would like to ask a question, please do so by typing it into the question window on our screen, and we will direct questions to the most appropriate speaker. Um, I'm going to start with um, a question that kind of riffs off what Krista just said. This was a crisis in January, it's a crisis now, and it looks like we'll have this crisis going forward. It might even get worse, you know, uh, going forward. But I think folks don't know it, and I think one of the powerful moments we're in 
is that it's become much more visible at this moment. What's really interesting is we have a number of questions of folks who really want to understand that better. So um, I'm going to combine a few questions and ask um, uh, Elizabeth and Barbara, you know, if you can share any stories about how the domestic violence, the domestic violence housing first program made a difference for real clients. I think there's a real hunger here based on the number of questions to really understand, I think, both the needs of the survivors as well as the model. Um, so if you could maybe, I'm going to ask you to be concise because I want to make sure with the time we have left to get a number of questions in. Sure. This is Elizabeth. Um, so I, this was really a game changer for us as an organization to be able to provide rental support to survivors. And even just recently to address the COVID issues, it really was connected to our community relationships with landlords. In March, when everything was starting to go down, we had landlords reach out to us to ask if we had any survivors that needed housing. And we were able to place two families into permanent housing situations. And that's really due to the relationships between our advocates and those landlords. So. I think that the other thing I just want to speak to is it's not just rental assistance. Many of our survivors are living in poverty. Others, everyone's living paycheck to paycheck. And so something as simple as their car breaking down can be a game changer for them. They have to figure out how they're going to get to work and how they're going to pay rent if they pay their auto um, repair bill. So we've been able to assist survivors in that way to be able to pay for their auto repair so they can get to work, to be able to pay for childcare. So there are so many stories, um, and I, I just am having a hard time sharing just one, but I think that it's just been a real game changer for us in, in the way we're able to support survivors. And um, this is Barbara from East Los Angeles Women's Center. It definitely has changed the way we work with survivors, giving them choices, um, in regards to either rehousing them or keeping them in their own homes. And the other one that we've done several times is actually slide people back east or back to their homes where they have somewhere where they could stay. Um, that was a possibility. So the idea is it's not just flexible funds, but it gives us flexibility in solving this problem. And that's the, the gift of this um, project. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about our first client, and I won't go into it because we don't have much um, time, but she came to us after years of abusive relationship, and um, she came to our shelter first, and then we were able to house her in an affordable housing, um, working with New Economics for Women, who partnered with us. So the partnerships are critical here, development, develop, development, and um, landlords and the community in large is important to this project to work together at solving this problem. And, um, you know, today she's working, she's three years later, she's still in her apartment and that um, allows us to know that this works and, um, and we're able to um, continue to work with uh, multiple families in helping them solve their housing um, issues, but also helping them um, ground themselves emotionally and, and helping them really find peace in their life. Thank you both. Um, th this actually, I'm going to ask a policy related question, but it doesn't sound, it's not written that way, but I think that's what it is. So I'm going to ask Krista and maybe Jessica to speak to this. Um, oh, actually, Elizabeth, you may have insight here on this as well. What is the future of the domestic violence housing first model in California, especially as COVID-19 has wiped out the finances of our clients and whatever housing security they were able to establish. More flexible financial support is more critical now than ever to prevent our survivors from losing everything they have built up through this program. Um, Krista, I'm gonna ask you, since you're one of the policy experts on the call, Jessica and Elizabeth, I know you're doing some local work as well, so would love for you to chime in briefly. Yeah, I can start, thank you. Um, so the Domestic Violence Housing First program here in California is funded solely using federal dollars. 
um, they come to the state and are administered out by the Office of Emergency Services, but the source of those dollars is federal. And interestingly, the federal source is actually from what's known as the Victims of Crime Act Fund. And this is not regular taxpayer money, it's the fines and fees collected um, from criminal prosecution of white collar crime. What we have seen is that deposits into that fund have been declining over the last few years. And we have been concerned about, therefore, decreases in how much Congress would release from the fund. So that's been a big part of our federal advocacy to secure some fixes to help stabilize the funding of the Victims of Crime Act and to continue to ensure that Congress is releasing high levels of Victims of Crime Act funds. Those dollars pay for DV Housing First, but also a whole range of Victims of Crime Act needs, so they're essential across the board. Um, this is part of why we, back in January, even before COVID had happened, had prioritized um, state investment into DV Housing First as well, because we know that while the federal funding is essential, it isn't necessarily the only source we should be relying on. So a little bit of this, I will say, is I don't know. Um, it remains an incredibly successful and important program that I know we want to see continue to be funded. Um, and the regular annual appropriations from Congress, their regular funding bills, are due to be done before September 30th when the federal fiscal year ends. Um, but that, you know, is a work in progress. And obviously, they've been doing COVID response as well. Um, advocating mm -hmm. for increased funding to the Victims of Crime Act is also part of our COVID advocacy. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a solid answer other than we continue to advocate for these dollars to remain. Great. Elizabeth or Jessica, do you have anything to add to what Krista may have may, uh, with, to what Krista said? This is Jess Bartholow, and I would just like to add, um, you know, I do think it's important for us to be vigilant on the topic of funding for services for domestic abuse survivors. We uh, just today got an announcement by the Department of Finance that we are seeing um, budget deficits as high as $50 billion. This is, uh, this, the number is so high. This represents almost half of our general fund. Um, we will have a lot to do in California to reconcile those numbers as we move forward. And as people who, uh, many of you I'm sure, um, were serving uh, the community when we went through the last recession, you know that it means everything will be on the table, including the programs that serve survivors. So to the extent that you have programs funded by general fund or other, other county, state, or local funds, um, which, which serve as a, um, as an envelope or as, as a, as a cushion around these programs, housing first programs, know that, that uh, we're going to have to be really diligent to make sure that those important ride-along programs are um, are still available. Because, um, as one of the speakers said, we need we need the whole package uh, in order to make sure that uh, uh, survivors have all the options available to them. So that's the only thing I would add to that is just you know plug in, listen to the uh, your leaders at the state capitol. They're going to need you to activate around the programs that you have in place, and I hope you will do that. Yeah, hi, this is Elizabeth again. I can just speak real quickly about what we're doing in Los Angeles. We have used this evaluation report to really lift up um, how important this model is for survivors with our policymakers. And we were successful in having the city's housing and community investment department request $3 million from the, ha the state HAP funding, which is the homeless funding that is from the state to the all counties, the largest cities, and each continuum of care. And whether or not that gets funded, who knows? I mean, everything's kind of in limbo right now. But just the fact that they were able to request it and that they're finally listening and hearing us and, and recognizing the importance of this model, I thought was a huge win. On the federal level, the HUD is, has put out the DV bonus for the past 
few years, which includes the Domestic Violence Rapid Rehousing Program. And in Los Angeles, that program has been implemented utilizing the DV Housing First model. In our county, our local measure each funding, we, we have also advocated there that they utilize the rapid rehousing funding using the DV Housing First money, but because of the current crisis, we're looking at deficits there and likely a reduction in a lot of those grants. So I'm not sure what will happen there, but I think the biggest thing that we can try and get across to policymakers is this recognition of the intersection of domestic violence and homelessness that whenever homelessness is being talked about that we bring up the fact that survivors are so vulnerable and their housing is unstable or they're at risk of homelessness like lucia mentioned having to choose between staying in a violent household or becoming homeless there's got to be more options for them but on the other side we have to have that support to be able to say you don't have to become homeless. So we need to continue advocating for this model, whether they want to call it rapid rehousing, as long as we are implementing the three different pillars, I think that that's really what makes it successful for survivors. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all three of you. Um, I think one one question that I want to come back to is really around uh, around prevention, which is, you know, how how the question here that um, that is embedded in some of the other questions that we're getting is, how does the model work to actually prevent domestic violence or homelessness? And I think this is uh, I'm going to maybe take some license and say kind of in the long term, how does this happen? Because I think that's what we're wanting for families collectively is to end domestic violence and to end homelessness and uh would love to know thoughts about you know how you observe this happening um elizabeth i think i'm going to direct that one to you because of the case study that your model had in particular okay so i mean i i did already speak about the different ways that we support survivors beyond just rental support and how people mm -hmm. are just so mm -hmm. financially unstable and that's going to get worse and we're also going to see a lot more requests for service beyond the the participants that we're serving right now but I'm also thinking about subsidized housing because a lot of people that we place in their own rental units you know after our support is gone they're really struggling to pay the rent and the fact that they're or so few affordable housing units makes it really challenging to even identify housing for families who are mm -hmm. struggling. So I think being able to advocate for additional subsidized housing, low income housing, it doesn't necessarily need to be Section 8, but like Nilda had shared before, we really need to expand the length of time that we can support someone. What we see at Rainbow is being able to support people for at least 24 months helps them to be a little bit more successful in maintaining their permanent housing. I would love to see being able to support people for 36 months, but that's going to take a lot of money, right? And yet, mm -hmm. it's a lot more money if they become homeless. So anything we can do to try and prevent them from losing their housing or anything we can do to get people quickly housed um, once they've made the decision to either leave their home or have the person who's harming them leave their home and support them. I think that's where a lot of people struggle is once the, the person who's harming them leaves and how are they going to pay the rent if they're able to stay in their own home. So the, the longer we can support people, I think the more successful they will be. Lucia, I have another story. Yes. Could I? Yes, absolutely. So we had a um, a client that we helped with Housing First funds. Um, she wouldn't have been able to stay in the, her new place or in, with her children if it wasn't for the Housing First funds. Um, she would have had to get a second job. She already had a job. But what she did instead with her free time because of the Housing First funds, instead of getting a second job, 
She worked on getting a typing certificate. And then with that typing certificate, she was able to get a full-time job with the state where it may, where it may make way more than her first job and, and not be homeless. Great, thank you. Thank you. That that example and um, really the last few comments really, again, underscore how this is a domestic violence issue and it's also a housing issue and it's also an economic security issue if you take the long view. I want to underscore perhaps something that's a little implicit and I want to make explicit, which is that this is not just helping a survivor, but all of you mentioned children in some of your comments throughout the day. And I want to underscore that this is not helping just 925 survivors, but actually it's multiplied by the children in those families and uh, multiplied by the sites that actually there were 60 plus sites, not 19 sites that are part of this program. It's just the 19 that were evaluated. And so that's the power from of this model. I'm going to wrap us up. I want to thank all of you for joining us and for your shared commitment to addressing domestic violence and homelessness in California. A recording of this webinar, slides from today's presentation, and additional resources related to this work will be available on Blue Shield of California Foundation's website. Uh, so again, the recording, the slides, and additional resources will be found are on our on our website now. A follow-up email will, with details on how to access those materials will also be sent to participants next week. You can look on the last slide here. Here's a link to the materials. I want to thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. I want to thank our panelists one more time. And until next time, be safe and be well. Have a great afternoon.